Well, we continue our study in the book of Revelation tonight. It's very exciting, very interesting as we look at the opening three chapters of Revelation, which deal with the seven churches of Asia Minor. But as we've noticed, each one of these churches reflects not only a period of church history, in addition to being literal churches to whom our Lord sent his letter through his amanuensis John, but they also represent the same kind of churches you can find in every period of church history. We're looking at the Church of, Revela of uh, Philadelphia tonight, and that's the Philadelphia of Asia Minor, not the Philadelphia across the river from us. Second half of that, we're in Revelation chapter 3, and studying verses 7 through 13. <clears throat> if you'd have a, like to follow along, there's a Bible in the back of the pew facing you. Revelation chapter 3, last book of the New Testament. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we look into your word tonight, that you will cause your word to penetrate our hearts, that you will show us the sin that is inside of us that needs to be confessed, from which we need to repent, that you will show us the way of righteousness so that we might walk in it, so that you will fill our hearts with joy and gladness and give our lives the ability to serve you. Father, we know that we are only filled with joy when we're doing what you want us to do. Everything else is empty, it's sawdust. It's dry. It doesn't seem to have any meaning. But when we walk with you, when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with you and with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanseth us from all sin. We thank you, Father, for the privilege we have of studying your word. We pray that you will open our hearts and make us to understand it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last week, you recall, as we were looking at this passage, we talked about the claim that Jesus makes for himself, that he is the one that is holy. And we saw that that phrase throughout Scripture is used to speak of Jehovah, God himself, the one who is known by what's called the Tetragrammaton, whenever you see the word Lord with all capital letters, that's the four-letter word in Hebrew, Yahweh. Jesus, by making this claim for himself, is claiming to be the God of the Old Testament. Because it is Jesus who is speaking here. We know that as we opened Revelation chapter 1 and saw that he's the one who says to John, write these letters to the seven churches. Here's what I want you to write to each one of the seven churches. So he begins by making a declaration here to Philadelphia of his deity. The second thing we see is that he calls himself true. Jesus is called the truth. And he said, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You cannot get to God according to Jesus. You cannot get to God by Buddha or Mohammed or Confucius. Or in the Christian realm, you cannot get to God by Mary or one of the saints. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, either Jesus is telling us the truth, or he is lying to us, or the Bible is wrong. You have to make a choice. If Jesus is telling us the truth, he is the only way to the Father. That's John chapter 10. He is the one that is true. In his high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, where Jesus is praying for the disciples, and for us, because he says, I pray not only for these, but those who will believe on my name through their words. So they're going to testify about Jesus. Jesus makes a very important statement in verse 17 of John 17. John 17, 17. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So Jesus upheld the inspiration of scripture. Jesus himself told us that the word of God is truth. This is, according to him, absolute truth. We must make a choice at the outset. Is Jesus who he said he is? And can we believe what Jesus tells us? Is Jesus the one who is called the living word and he's the one who points to the written word is he the one whom we can trust those are the two things that we learn as we look first at this letter to the church in Philadelphia he is the holy one of Israel a phrase that is used only of God he is the one who is true Jesus spoke of himself as the truth. He is also the one who was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who, John tells us, came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The apostles got the message. In the opening chapters of the book of Acts, as Peter stands up and preaches on the day of Pentecost, he explains to them that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus and Jesus only. Anyone who teaches a different method of salvation is in contradiction to the Bible, is in contradiction to Jesus Christ, is in contradiction to the apostles. Jesus is the only way of salvation. But he offers it freely. Why would you go anywhere else? He demonstrated his love for you by dying on Calvary's cross. He demonstrated the truth of his love for you by rising from the dead. Without the resurrection, Christianity is a, a farce. It's a hoax. Without the resurrection of Christ, we have no hope. Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to our salvation. It's central to our resurrection. It's central to our purpose in life. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no purpose in life. Everything is hopeless. Now that's the background just by looking at these first two claims that our Lord makes for himself. He that is holy, he that is true. The next phrase is actually a combination of three things that is a direct quote out of the book of Isaiah. He that hath the key of David... 
He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. That is a quotation out of Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22. Let me read it to you. Those three things are a direct reference to us one specific prophecy. I'm going to start reading from Isaiah 22 verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe. Now we're going to be talking about robes in just a minute. So here's somebody who's going to get clothed with a robe. I will strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit the government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now look at verse 22. This is what is being quoted directly in Revelation. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. That's what Jesus says about himself in Revelation, where we've just read. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne of his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all the vessels of small quantity, from the, cups, from the vessels of the cups even to the vessels of the flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, we're going to have to wait until we pick up a couple of other things. But I wanted you to see that what we're looking at here is not just Jesus saying something, and you wonder what it means. There is a specific prophecy in the book of Isaiah, the most important book filled with messianic prophecies in all of the Old Testament. And Jesus quotes that of himself. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. The next thing he says down here in verse 8, he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and not denied my name. So we get back to that same theme in verse 7, he that openeth, and no man shutteth. Jesus says to the church at Philadelphia, I'm going to give you an open door. Now what do you do with open doors? You say, well, I, I try to close them because the draft is coming in. If it's too hot in the summer, my cold air is going out. And if it, you know, it's in the middle of the winter, the cold air is coming in. Well, no, that's not really what doors are for, for letting air in and out. It's for people to go in and out. And Jesus says, I'm going to open a door for you, and nobody can shut it. That takes us back to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The Lord Jesus Christ is reminding the church of Philadelphia of the great promises that he made as the shepherd of the sheep. He's the one who provides our safety. The door can close and it can keep the bad guys out. The door can open and let the sheep go forth where they can find pasture. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. For thou hast a little strength. The church at Philadelphia was not big and powerful and strong. It was a little church. It had a little strength, but you know what Jesus is telling them? It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Again, a quotation from Isaiah. Jesus is telling them, if I'm with you, nobody can stop you. If I open the door, nobody can shut it. And if I shut the door for your church, nobody can open it. That's both a blessing and a warning. A church that is walking by faith, a church that is doing what God wants it to do, can be a very small church and seem to have absolutely nothing, no resources, no strength, no ability. And Jesus says, I can keep the doors open. 
A church can be big and powerful and fat and lazy and slothful like some of the other churches that we looked at already. And Jesus says, I can close those doors and nobody can get in. That church will die. Jesus is portrayed as the Lord of the churches, plural. Remember the last verse? This is what ends, that same verse ends every one of the seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, not just to the church at Philadelphia, unto the churches. There are lessons here in this passage for us today. Now they had some people who were trying to close their church down. It tells you about them in verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. There are only a couple of churches in this list where Jesus declares his love for them. He has to speak words of rebuke to most of them, but he speaks words of love to some of them. He chastens some of the churches, but he blesses and heals others of the churches. He tells them something else in verse 10, which is a marvelous thought, because he's going to talk about this. The book of Revelation is going to describe in detail what this hour of temptation or hour of testing trial is. Jesus says, I've got a special promise for you. Because you have kept the word of my patience. Now let's pause for a minute. I hope you guys remember the difference between patience and long-suffering. Those are two different words in Greek, two different words in English. And each of them deals with something very specific. Long-suffering is the ability to put up with difficult people. That's right. Patience means being able to put up with difficult circumstances. That's right. You're going to go through some difficult circumstances in life. Patience is what will get you through it. But you know what brings about patience? The Apostle Paul explains it to us. He says, tribulation worketh patience. The way that God develops patience in our lives is allowing us to go through hard times so that we learn to trust Him. When you come to the end of your rope, when you're not able any longer to handle the pressure that's coming into your life, there's only one way to look. You have to look up. And that's when he reaches his hand down and he takes your hand and he lifts you up and he helps you through it. And he develops in you not only patience, but he develops faith where you learn to trust him more and more and more for everything in life. But he talks about the hour of temptation that's going to come upon all the world to try, that's the word that means to put to the test, those that dwell upon the earth. In Revelation chapter 4 all the way through Revelation chapter 19 is dealing with that period of time. It's known as the Great Tribulation in Scripture. It's a seven-year period of time, according to the Bible, in which the Bible-believing Christians, those who have trusted Jesus alone for their salvation, are caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds and evermore to be with the Lord. And at that time, during that seven-year period, which is yet future for us, during that seven-year period, there's going to be this horrible trouble on earth. And we'll be talking about that as we get to chapter 4 and following. The believers are in heaven at what's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. And they'll be clothed in white raiment. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, the Lord willing, as we move into the details. And they're going to be with Christ. And they're called the Bride of Christ. And then at the end of that period of seven years, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back with us, those who have trusted him for salvation, and destroys the Antichrist who is on earth and the false prophet who is on earth. 
and who have been doing horrible things as we see during the tribulation period. But he promises the church of Philadelphia, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. We're going to see that phrase again. I come quickly a little bit later in the book of Revelation. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. The promise of living forever in the New Jerusalem. And it says, which comes down from heaven. That's also over in the book of Revelation 19, chapter 19. So many of the things that you see here in relation to the church of Philadelphia, you're going to see later on coming up again in the book of Revelation with a lot more detail. And I'll write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, last week when we began our study of the church of Philadelphia in Asia Minor, we saw that there was a very interesting tie-in and contrast with the church at Sardis where Jesus promised <coughs> the remnant <coughs> at the church at Sardis that he would give them white robes. Give those to the faithful few in contrast to the fancy colorful robes which was historically one of the products of the city of Sardis. White robes appear very frequently in the book of Revelation. They're usually seen in relation to the pureness of Christ but when they are seen on believers they speak of us being clothed in his righteousness and purity. The Bible also portrays holy angels in white robes, robes of moral righteousness and purity. That also fits very beautifully, this business at Sardis of the white robes, with what Jesus portrays himself here in Philadelphia, where he writes, These things saith he that is holy. Now last week we didn't have time to look at the white robes in the book of Revelation and elsewhere in the New Testament, but let me just give you a summary of a few of the verses because it ties us to three very important fundamental Bible doctrines that are found throughout all of Scripture when we look at the white robes. You'll see that in a second. The first place I want you to glance at is Revelation chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11. We find here people who have been killed for their faith. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are people who were killed not because they were criminals, not because they did bad things. These are people who were killed because they were believers. That happens all over the world today. If you're in a Muslim country, you can expect that might happen to you if you get caught. If you're in certain communist countries like North Korea, you know that's going to happen to you if you get caught. And we've been praying that out of all those things that went on and the behind the scenes monkeying around that's going on right now after the meeting that President Trump had with Kim Jong-un, we're praying for the believers, probably between 100,000 and 300,000 who are in concentration camps in North Korea right now. Why? Because of their faith. And many more have been murdered because of their faith. Here we have them. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, Holy and true. Holy. Who are they crying to? Jesus says, the one that's talking to you is the one that is holy. They're crying out to Jesus. Jesus is their avenger. Jesus is portrayed in scripture as the final judge. Jesus himself said, the father hath committed all judgment unto the son. Jesus is not only the savior, but he is the judge. And each one of us will stand before him either as our savior or as our judge. And he is holy. He is holier than... He can't look upon sin. It is intolerable in his sight. The book of Habakkuk explains that. Who are they crying to? How long, O Lord, holy and true? 
True, that's the second thing that we saw concerning the church at Philadelphia, wasn't it? Jesus said, these things hath he that is holy, he that is true. So here's the one who is going to avenge the blood of the martyrs. Dost thou not yet avenge, judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now look, here's our white robes. Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. As you look at the scope of history... Do you think that anything takes God unawares? Do you think that there is any event in the course of all of history that snuck up on God and happened and he said, Oh man, I didn't plan for that. Or is God not only omniscient, that is he knows everything that's going to happen, but he is omnipotent. That is, nothing can escape his direct intervention and direction. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 tells us, And we know that all things work together for good, but only for a specific group of people. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You say, but these are people who are being killed. God even worked that together for their good and for his glory. You say, how in the world could that be? I thought if I become a Christian that everything's going to be easy and rosy. No, when you became a Christian, you suddenly became different than all the rest of the world around you who rejects Christ, all the rest of the world around you, who's under the control of Satan and his demonic forces. But the book of Revelation tells us what happens to them in the end. Let me do something to you in the interim. But in the end, we're told over in Revelation chapter 19, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Satan is not in charge of hell. Hell is the ultimate destiny of Satan. Satan doesn't cast people into hell. Satan is going to suffer there with them, those who've rejected Jesus. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is either your Savior and gives you heaven and eternal life, or if you reject him, he is your judge. And someday you will have to bow before him. And he will say, I gave you the opportunity to trust me. And you made a choice. You said, I think I'm going to try to make it on my own. I don't think I want you, Jesus. I think I'm good. Yeah, some people around me are bad. And yeah, I've done a few bad things. But after all, I've done a lot of good works. Did you know the book of Revelation talks a lot about good works? We're going to get to that in a second. But never does it or anywhere else in Scripture say you're saved by your good works. You're going to die someday, maybe tonight. When God took Judy home, we had no idea the night before. We'd gone out to dinner. We'd had a wonderful time together. And in less than 24 hours, she was in heaven. She seemed to be in perfect health, good strength. And she stepped into eternity. You don't know when you're going to die, and neither do I. But I know I'm ready. Do you know that you are ready? Because when you die, you will stand before Jesus, either as your Savior, and you'll hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, or you will stand before him as your judge. And you will have rejected him and says, because you rejected me, you chose a different option. You chose to spend eternity with Satan and his demons in the lake of fire. Those are the only two options the Bible gives. Now remember that takes us back to what we talked about first. Is the Bible true or is the Bible not true? Jesus said the Bible is true. In his high priestly prayer, remember he said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't cut it any other way. Either he's telling us the truth, or he's lying, or he's nuts. You look at the Gospels, you know he's not nuts. So your only two options are, is he telling us the truth, or is he lying to us? If he's telling us the truth, it means that he is the only way to God. And he proved that by rising from the dead. He paid for your sins on the cross, he rose from the dead for your justification. That's what the Bible tells us. So unto each one of them were given white robes, and they were told to rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. The second passage I want you to look at related to white robes, and you'll see why I'm going through these in just a second, because it ties us to the three key doctrines that we must understand as we approach the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7. We find the white robes are mentioned both in verses 9 and verse 13. I'll begin reading in verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now, when we get in detail in that chapter and contrast it with chapter 6, chapter 6, white robes are given to martyrs. In chapter 7, white robes are given to this vast multitude of believers who are the believers of the church age in which we live, all the way from the day of Pentecost, all the way to the day of the rapture. And we find them coming from every country all over the world. <laughs> Jesus gave a commission. What did he say just before he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1? He said, Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You know what? Over the last 2,000 years, that's been the mission of the church to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And we find, as we look at Revelation 7, it says, Behold, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. You say, well, what does the white robes mean? Ah, uh, there'll be another passage we look at in just a second that explains it to us. The very next passage. And these people are crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now you know from Revelation chapter 1 that the Lamb that is standing, that is a slain Lamb, but it's standing, that's the resurrected Christ. Jesus is the Lamb. <laughs> John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus fulfills all the Old Testament sacrificial pictures and types of the lambs that were brought and laid on the altar and slain by the priests and their blood was poured out on the altar. Those all foreshadowed, those all pictured in that Old Testament sacrificial system all gave a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. A lamb appears in Revelation 1. He's a lamb that's been slain, but he's standing that's a resurrected lamb. And here we find him mentioned again. They stood before the throne and before the lamb. The lamb is Jesus. 
clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. They're falling before Jesus. The angels are bowing before him. Again, we have a very clear statement of his deity. You remember we also looked at Isaiah chapter 6 when we were talking about holiness and the throne of God, Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, says, saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he said, all around his throne, there, there were these seraphim. Those are the burning ones. There are different categories of angel seraphims, means the burning ones, versus the cherubim, cherubim, which is the covering angels over the throne of God. But the cherubim, the burning ones, which compose the Shekinah glory of God, and what are they crying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And John tells us in John chapter 12 that the one who was sitting on the throne, whom the angels were worshiping, before whom they were crying, holy, 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 that that one was Jesus. John says so in the Gospel of John chapter 12. You see, the scripture is a unit. It's not a bunch of individual books that don't interrelate with each other, that don't seem to make any sense. When you begin to look at these passages, like that first quotation that I gave you out of Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, Jesus is quoting Isaiah and applying it to himself as he speaks to the church at Philadelphia. The book of Revelation is full of that. So you go back and you study the context, which is a gigantic context in the Old Testament, and suddenly you understand what Jesus is doing and claiming in the book of Revelation. But anyway, here we find even the angels falling before the throne, saying, Blessing, glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Now verse 13, here we find the white robes again. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Now listen to verse 14 very carefully. Because unless you understand a specific Greek phrase that's in verse 14, you won't know who he's talking about. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So you've got your white robes here again. Where do they get their white robes? They say, came out of tribulation. Oh, these must have been people who were going through the tribulation and who got killed. No, that's not what that phrase means. The, the way in which the prepositional phrase is used here, came out of, it's the same phrase that the Apostle Paul uses when he speaks of having been rescued out of the mouth of the lion. Now Paul was not being chewed on by a lion and somebody came over and ripped open the mouth of the lion and pulled Paul out. When Paul says, I was saved out of the mouth of the lion, he's talking about how he was just about to be thrown to the lions and God rescued him. That's exactly what happens to the people who go up at the rapture. The world is getting worse, and the world is getting worse, and believers are beginning to panic, and some of them are, are running out into the woods and finding places where they can build a cabin in the woods and hope that they can escape what's going on. You know, and they're the survivalist types, and they've stockpiled food, and they've stockpiled weapons, and they've stockpiled, you know, whatever else they think they're gonna need. It gets so bad. But the Antichrist has not yet come on the scene and declared himself to be God by sitting in the temple, which is prophesied in the book of Daniel and it's reconfirmed in the book of Revelation. And just before that happens, the rapture takes place. The angel descends from heaven with a shout with the voice of God, the trump of the archangel. The dead in Christ rise. We which are alive shall be caught up to meet them in the air and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It happens instantly before the tribulation begins. 
It's going to happen in such a way that the whole world won't care what happened to the Christians. The world won't want to know. It may be in the middle of a nuclear war. Who knows what it'll be like? But they'll be very glad that we're gone because we were a pain in the neck to them. They didn't like it when we preached to them. They didn't like it when we said, the Bible says you're a sinner, but it gives you life if you trust Jesus. And we don't want to hear that. But don't you want life? Go away from me. I don't want any of that stuff. That's the phrase that's used here, the prepositional phrase. The same that was used by the Apostle Paul, speaking of him being saved out of the mouth of the lion. These are they which came out of great tribulation, just before the great tribulation hit. These are people who have washed their robes. That is, they have clean robes because they've been washed by something. What is it? In the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know, the Gospel of John presents Jesus not only as the Lamb of God, but it presents him as the Good Shepherd. And here is a lamb leading people instead of people leading lambs. It's a beautiful picture that's given to us. But he is the one who will feed us. He's the one who will lead us. He leads us by the still waters. He restores our soul. Psalm 23 is a reference to Jesus. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what's the last part? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here we have. The lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. He shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now let's look at the symbolism, what it means with the white robes. Revelation chapter 19, jump ahead, 12 chapters. Verse 8 of Revelation chapter 19 explains the symbolism of being clothed in fine linen, clean and white. It explains to us that that is the picture. Book of Revelation is is telling about literal events, but it's using symbolic pictures to explain the literal events. And here it tells us, it explains one of the, the symbols that is used in Revelation. That the fine linen, clean and white, is imputed righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ which has been put on the books. That's what imputation deals with. It means it's a bookkeeping term, which means that this is being transferred to our account. We had a debit on our account and then we had the righteousness of Christ transferred to our account so we're no longer in debt to God. Let me start in verse 6, Revelation 19. And I heard, as it were, the voice of great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. Now look, we've got the Lamb showing up again. Who is the Lamb? Everybody say it together. The lamb is Jesus. Let's try it again. The lamb is Jesus. That's right. The lamb shows up in the opening chapters. The lamb keeps showing up over and over and over again. And we find him in his love relationship with his bride, the church. But we're also going to see that the lamb is going to judge. You think, who ever heard of a lamb judging? The book of Revelation talks about the lamb judging. If you don't take him as your savior... You have got him as your judge. There are no other options. But let me get back to this for just a second here. Let us be glad and rejoice, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now who is the bride of Christ? Paul tells us. It's the church. It's those who've trusted in Jesus. The church is not a building. 
The church is not an organization. The church is not a denomination. The church is composed of every person from the day of Pentecost until the day of the rapture that is trusted in Jesus Christ. We've done extensive studies on that in the past, but that's consistent all the way through the New Testament. The church is not some organization that has a headquarters someplace. The church, according to the New Testament, is that entire group of people who have trusted in Jesus Christ all the way from the birthday of the church in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, all the way to the rapture of the church as we over in 2 Thessalonians. If you've trusted in Jesus, you are part of the bride of Christ. The bride has made herself ready. And what is she going to wear? And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white and clean. Now here, it explains what that means. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now the first thing we have to do is rid our minds of the, the Roman Catholic concept of who are saints. Rome teaches that only people who have been canonized by the Pope after having done a graveside miracle sometime after their death, only those people are saints. That is not the way the New Testament uses the word saints. Hagioi. Hagios, singular for uh, a saint or a holy one. Hagioi is the plural for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you ought to jot this down and look it up later if you don't believe me. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes to the saints which are at Corinth. You think to yourself, now let's see, which saints were at Corinth? Paul's writing to them, and there's St. Paul, and, uh, but that means he was someplace else, so Paul wasn't at Corinth. Let's see, was, was Peter at Corinth? No. Was Andrew at Corinth? No. Was James at Corinth? No. You can go through the whole list of all the official saints, and you won't find any of them at Corinth. But as you begin to read in the opening chapter of 1 Corinthians, nine verses are given to talking about these people as a church, as a group of believers, and their position in Christ. The only good things that are said about that group of people are in verses 1 through 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You don't find anything else good said about them in the entire rest of the book. The rest of the book, from chapter 1, verse 10, all the way to the end of 1 Corinthians, that is a church that was getting bawled out, getting scolded for their wickedness and carnality. They had a guy who was sleeping with his father's wife. They were suing each other in courts of law. They were getting drunk at the Lord's table. They were gluttonizing at the Lord's table and pushing away poor people so they couldn't get any of it. I mean, that was a bad church. But Paul calls them the saints at Corinth. You see, being a saint is not a matter of your own personal holiness. Being a saint means you are one who has been set apart. That's what the literal meaning of the word hagios, or saint, that's the literal meaning of the word. It means one who has been set apart. God, when you trusted Jesus, sets you apart for his service. You now have a new special relationship with him. He sets you apart for his service. Now I'm going to say something that you'll think is funny. I'd like to introduce myself to y'all. Uh, uh, my name is I'm Saint Christian. <laughs> you say, ooh, that sounds terrible. Sounds arrogant. Well, actually, it's true, but not in the sense that people think of it being true. I'm one who has been set apart by God for his service. If you've trusted Jesus, you are one who has been set apart for the service of God. And he has special blessings and special promises that are to you because he has set you apart. Now, where do the saints that are mentioned here in these verses get their righteousness? It says the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So when you find the fine, white, clean linen, you've got your definition here in the book of Revelation. It's the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now here we get to the three. can't believe our time is almost up. It really is up, but I'm going to cover this because this is where we wanted to get tonight. To the three key doctrines that are dealt with when we're looking at this symbolism of the white robes in the book of Revelation. 
The first doctrine, biblical doctrine, that is dealt with here is the doctrine of imputation. Imputation. Legitimai. Imputation is one of the key doctrines of the cross. The second doctrine that we have to use to set in contrast with imputation is the doctrine of justification. In the doctrine of justification, and you know the New Testament talks all about justification all over the place. I mean, you know, the just shall live by faith, that kind of thing. And uh, Abraham was justified um, by his faith. And we find justification is all over. It's in Romans, it's in Galatians, it's in Ephesians. I mean, justification is a very major doctrine. That was one of the basic doctrines of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. That was the battle cry of the Reformation, why the Protestant reformers left Rome. And so that's the first thing. We need to understand what is the difference between imputation and justification. Justification means that we are declared righteous. Justification is a declaration. It doesn't make you righteous. It declares you righteous. For example, you're at a court of law. The judge is sitting up there. You've been accused of a crime. The witnesses come. And then the witnesses for your side come and they say, we can prove to you that he was not at the scene of the crime when the crime occurred. And they show a movie of you at a birthday party with them. And the date is very clear as to when that birthday party took place and the judge looks at it and then he looks at the crummy evidence that says that you're the guy who committed the murder and he says, you know what? It's quite obvious this is not the one that committed the murder. I'm going to declare him righteous. He's innocent. He's not guilty. Now, that's what he didn't, the judge didn't make you innocent, but he declared you to be innocent based on the evidence. Okay, that's justification. Imputation is the doctrine that deals with what makes you righteous. What makes, not just declares you, what makes you righteous. Now, both of those doctrines are the result of the finished work of Christ on the cross. But imputation is the doctrine that explains how we are made righteous through faith. Now let's go back to justification for just a second. You're going to see how this fits the book of Revelation. It's very important in the book of Revelation. Number one, justification. Justification has two aspects to it. And if you've never heard this before, I hope you're writing it down. And you can check it out with every passage of Scripture where justification is mentioned. The first aspect of justification is how God sees us. The second aspect of justification is how man sees us. Now, when God looks at us, we are justified, we are declared righteous in his sight by faith. He can see our faith, nobody else can. He can see inside your heart, I can't. God knows the thoughts of man. I don't. So the first part of justification deals with how we are seen in the sight of God so that God can declare us righteous. The second aspect is how man sees us. But man can't see our faith. And James explains that. That's what the book of James is all about. How are we declared righteous, not made righteous? How are we declared righteous in the sight of men? James says, show me thy faith, O vain man, without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. We are declared righteous in the sight of men by what they can see. God sees our heart. We can't see the heart. But James talks about also, if you want to be declared righteous in the sight of men, they have to be able to see the fruit of the inner conversion that has already taken place when you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're declared righteous in the sight of God by faith. We're declared righteous in the sight of men by works. That's the point that James makes, for example, when he speaks of Rahab being justified by works. She wasn't saved by works. She was declared righteous by works. She demonstrated that she believed in the God of Israel by what she did. She was declared righteous in the sight of men by her works. 
even as Rahab is declared righteous in the sight of God by her faith. And both of those things are said in James, and he's not contradicting himself. Imputation stands in contrast. We are made righteous and only made righteous by faith in the finished work of Christ. That's the doctrine of imputation. Justification has nothing to do with making us righteous. It deals with declaring us righteous. Imputation deals with making us righteous. Very sadly, Rome has gotten those confused and has invented a doctrine of salvation by works as tied into the last judgment. So that's the third of the three issues that we have to study in the context of Revelation because it says a lot about works in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, works relates to two things also. Number one, and you ought to get these down because I don't think I've ever covered this particular aspect for you because it's a really big deal in Revelation and that's why I'm doing it now. Number one, Revelation covers, works covers two things in uh, Revelation. Number one, the establishment of guilt. Works are viewed and examined for the establishment of guilt in the book of Revelation. Number two, works are viewed and are examined to determine levels of punishment and levels of rewards in the book of Revelation. They're examined to determine levels of punishment and levels of rewards. Failure to understand this has led Rome to the unbiblical doctrine of purgatory. Now we're going to study that a little more in detail when we get farther into the book of Revelation. But let me just give you here an illustration of works being judged at what's been called the last judgment. We know there are multiple different judgments in the book of Revelation. There's a judgment of believers for their heavenly rewards. Uh, there's a judgment of the nations, uh, the sheep and the goat divisions uh, where they are, uh, those who have treated Israel properly and those who have not treated Israel properly. Uh, there is a judgment of Satan and his demonic uh, hosts. There's a judgment of the Antichrist and the false prophet. There are different judgments at different periods of or points of time in the book of Revelation. But what has normally been called the last judgment which is over at the end of the book of Revelation. Now, <clears throat> let me give you an illustration of works being judged at the last judgment. Unfortunately, not only Rome has gotten this wrong, but most Reformed churches never study it because they never study the book of Revelation. Sadly, that's the only book of the New Testament that John Calvin never wrote a commentary on. He said, I don't understand it. So many Reformed churches dismiss it as an allegory. But Revelation is a key book in understanding the proper way to view works and how God deals with works. I'm going to read you from Revelation chapter 20, and I know our time is up at this point, but I want to at least get through this passage here and say four things. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne... And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. Now listen. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Books plural. There's the book of life. And there are a whole bunch of smaller books. And each one of those is a book about somebody's life. One of those is a book about your life. One is a book about my life. Which were in them, and they were judged, now listen, which were the, judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The Bible's quite clear there is a hell. Now there are dozens of other passages in the Bible that talk about being judged according to our works. In fact, uh, that, that was something that fascinated me years and years ago. So I've been making a list of these judgments of works passages for many, many years, all the way back to my teenage years. But we'll see in context when we get to Revelation 20 that these have nothing to do with obtaining salvation. But there are many passages which talk about a judgment of works both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
Now, here's the last thing I'm going to say for us tonight. Here's a summary of it. Judgment of works passages fall into four categories. There are four categories of judgments of works. Number one, works that are a manifestation of those who have already saving faith. Works as a manifestation of those who already have saving faith. They're not doing it to get saved, but it is a proof. It's an outworking of their faith. Number two, second way we find what works being judged in scripture is a manifestation of those who do not have saving faith. They never produce works of righteousness. And we've talked about good works before. Good works are not helping little old ladies across the street. Good works are works that are done in faith to the glory of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit. If it misses any of those parts, it's not a good work. If you're doing it for your own glory, it's not a good work. If you're doing it in the power of the flesh, it's not a good work. It has to be done to the glory of God. If you're not doing it for God's glory, it's not a good work. The Bible very clearly defines what God calls good works. People try to re redefine it so they can feel they're good, but that's not the way the Bible defines it. So, it's a manifestation of those who do not have saving faith. Number three, good works are judged to show how God determines the level of rewards for the believer. Good works are judged to show how God determines the level of rewards for the believers. And number four, how God determines the level of punishment for the pagan. If you understand that works have nothing to do with salvation other than a manifestation of it, then you go a long way to understanding all the different passages that talk about works and God judging works throughout the scripture. But our time is up, definitely up. We're 15 minutes over time. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the letter to the church at Philadelphia. We thank you as we've just very done a very cursory overview right now of how many passages in the Old Testament it makes reference to and how many of those refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you, Father, for the way in which the Old Testament, when it is studied, gives us understanding of these concise passages in the New Testament so that we have the full-blown picture of who our Lord Jesus Christ is and what he did on Calvary's cross. We thank you, Father, that in your sight we are justified by faith and by faith alone. We thank you that you've told us that we have an obligation to manifest, to demonstrate that faith to the world around us so that they will understand how you have changed our lives when we trusted in Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we are declared righteous by you who sees the heart on the basis of faith. But we can only be declared righteous by those around us when they see our works, and that's what James says. We thank you, Father, that not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to your mercy, you saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, and how we thank you that you made us righteous through imputation, where you took the divine righteousness of Christ and placed it on our ledger, on our books, so that we would have imputed righteousness, not merely neutral, where Jesus forgave our sins and washed us clean, but we're in neutral. He put his righteousness to our account because we are in him. Your word tells us that we are in the beloved, that we are in Christ. Father, how we thank you that when you look at us, you look at us through Jesus and you see us in him. We've covered some difficult doctrines tonight, Father, but things that are reflected for us in this incredible letter to the church at Philadelphia here in the book of Revelation. We pray that you will give us greater understanding and cause us to see how the scriptures tie together. The more we study the scriptures, the more we see passages that relate to different passages and suddenly you open the door as you did at Philadelphia. You open a door that no man can shut and you can shut a door that no man can open. Father, we pray that you will open the door here, the Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, that you'll bring your people here that we might together serve you and that you'd give us an open door to this community so that we might see many coming to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For we pray it in his name. Amen. 
Our closing hymn tonight is number 597.